It's great to be here at the alternative to Davos. <laughs> <laughs> the digital currency idea is ending the underground economy. And I really want to show how these things are correlating. Hello, I'm Martin Armstrong. And I wanted to do this um, short video on the economic confidence model. I'd like to start with basically saying that um, <clears throat> From the very beginning, you have two forms of analysis. One where someone comes up with a theory, and then they go to do the research to try and prove it. That tends to lead to more of a cherry picking type thing to support the theory that's already the pre going conclusion. The other way to do research is you basically just happen to stumble upon something uh, and then try to understand it. Many things have been uh, developed that way. I mean, that was probably the primary difference between Adam Smith, who didn't understand how the economy worked and went off to discover how it actually did, as opposed to Marx, who pretty much looked at the economy and said, well, I don't like the way it works and it functions um, against what I believe. So he comes up with his theory about labor, et cetera, and profits and capitalism. And he goes off to prove that his theory is correct. So uh, <clears throat> in school, actually back in high school, I found that uh, contradictory because I would go to physics class and they would say nothing is random. Then I would go to economics class and they would say everything is random. So we can manipulate it, we can eliminate uh, recessions, depressions, uh, and the government can, can take care of this forever. So the, these were the two theories that were contradictory and it kind of really bothered me. Then what happened was, uh, <clears throat> because I was, my father was going to take us to Europe uh, when I was about 13 for the summer, uh, <clears throat> I went to earn my own money. So I really uh, got a part-time job in a bullion store. So I knew what gold was worth uh, it was $35 an ounce back then. And then in history class, uh, the teacher one day brought in a movie uh, called, you know, Toast of New York. Gentlemen, President Grant is releasing unlimited gold from the United States Treasury. The gold corner is broken. <laughs> It was about the Panic of 1869. And in there uh, is a scene where uh, the character Jim Fisk turns around uh, with the paper tape on gold that was trading on the New York uh, Stock Exchange at that time and turns around to his uh, girlfriend and says, Josie, gold hit $162. You can't lose. $162 and a half. Josie. Jim. Look, Josie, 162 and a half. I got him cornered. I got all the gold there is. They've got to buy for me now at any price I name. Now, that really disrupted everything I thought and was being taught in economics. And the idea was that everything was linear. So inflation progressively would move, etc., cetera, and uh, the economy grew steadily. Uh, all of a sudden, here we have uh, a film that said gold was $162 an ounce in 1869, and yet it was $35 today. So first I thought, basically, it was just a movie, and uh, it was not correct. Uh, they just made it up. But it bothered me, and I went down to the library, and I pulled out the old microfilms, and I looked 
And lo and behold, there was the New York Times quoting gold at $162 an ounce in the Panic of 1869. So suddenly, my linear idea of the world was completely wrong. Uh, I then saw that something could be substantially higher and then decline. And also in the late 60s, I watched real estate rise and then fall. There, it goes from a, a period where everybody wants it to, to uh, next year, nobody <clears throat> wants anything. Uh, you know, the, the rise and fall of markets were, was tremendous. Uh, I mean, I had uh, earned some money. My father told me to, uh, in 1966, he told me I should be investing uh, more conservatively rather than fooling around with commodities and invest in a Fidelity Trend mutual fund. Uh, so I did listen to my father and I bought it uh, around $54 or whatever it was and it, it promptly fell to about $7. And I turned to my father and I asked him, is this the way conservative people make their money? So everything I saw would go up to a boom and then a bust. So this whole idea that uh, the government could eliminate the boom and bust cycle was just absolute nonsense. So I basically uh, had always had a, a curiosity, I would say. Uh, and later on, I was uh, doing some research in the Firestone uh, Library, Princeton uh, University. And I came across an old article in the Wall Street Journal uh, from the Panic of 1907. And in there was a list of panics. So they covered from 1683 up to 1907. And here is basically the list. So I took this from the Wall Street Journal. I simply added up the, the period of time, which was 224 years. And I divided by the number of events, which was 26. And I came up with an average of 8.615 years. So I thought it was just an average. I didn't really think of it as being some sort of definitive thing. And I started looking historically and, and trying to, to see if there was some sort of regularity to, to the business cycle. And the more I investigated, uh, the more I found it, it actually was uh, following this particular time series. So it really became uh, quite interesting because in reading all the newspapers, uh, at the time, I would see that this thinking process also changed. And so I ended up coming up with what I would call the public versus private wave. For example, uh, during uh, the wave that peaked in 1929, uh, I would read the newspapers and they would have a completely different view of interest rates. If interest rates continued to, to rise, they looked at it as being bullish. And why? Because they said, well, it shows there's still a demand for money and the economy is expanding. When the economy is contracting, interest rates are declining, which is actually correct. Um, but what happened was after the Great Depression, we ended up with Keynesian economics. And suddenly this idea that the government can manipulate the business cycle and eliminate everything and create this land of uh, Marxist utopia uh, became very you know, dominant. And even Paul Volcker in the late 70s had um, done a speech and he called it the, the rediscovery of the business cycle. And in there, he explained that indeed for that whole period of time, 
that we had uh, economics was saying this was the new theory, new economics, we can eliminate the business cycle. He stood up and said, the business cycle has always won. And that's why he called it rediscovery of the business cycle. And uh, we have a very interesting situation and, and that the thinking process changes for generations. And some people say, you know, there's a generational shift and to, to some degree, perhaps that's correct. So as I said, in, in, in the twenties, if interest rates were rising, they saw it as bullish. When interest rates are declining, they saw it as bearish. Under Keynesian economics, we're concerned about what is the government trying to do to us. So if they raised interest rates, that meant that they wanted us to stop spending. And if they lowered rates, oh, they wanted us to increase spending. So the, the entire relationship or our thinking process flips. So what I named these as being public versus private in a private wave, raising interest rates is bullish. Um, and indeed, even if we look at the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates throughout the Trump administration, yet the stock market you know, would rally and they called it the Trump rally. So we have to get through these myths that have often come up and what the other, uh, I would say, detriment to analysis that we have to be careful of is that everybody tries to reduce whatever it is with single cause and effect. And it's never a single cause and effect. So like climate, oh, it's CO2. And there too, we have the climate you know, change zealots, but they've only gone back to the 1850s. So, oh, the, you know, see, uh, must be the Industrial Revolution because the climate is warming. But we were coming out of the Little Ice Age in the late uh, 1600s to early 1700s. Um, if you go back in time, you find that there were warming periods and cooling periods. Uh, even in, go back to Roman times, you find Cicero complaining about pollution. Uh, they were using wood to, to you know, heat homes and things of that nature. Uh, to the point that the first Clean Air Act was actually put in place by the Emperor Justinian in 561 AD, because everyone burning wood also creates CO2, and it also creates more pollution. So, you know, we have to look at things more from a, a total global perspective. And what I've, I've seen is how the psychology changes between these waves of public to private. Uh, there's more to it even than that. And I would notice being a trader that um, trading, you know, any particular market towards the end of the day, all of a sudden it would drop off would be a little mini crash. Uh, and then that same pattern of rising during the day and then dropping for the close uh, would then migrate to the weekly level and then to the monthly level. So I, I began to see patterns in trading. And that was very significant in, in the sense that then I realized that time is very important, but it's also fractal. So what takes place on the daily level are patterns that then migrate to the uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly level. So it's, what are we looking at? We're looking at really not a particular instru instrument, if it's the Dow Jones or gold or uh, the euro. We're looking at human activity and how we respond to news. Be it bullish, bearish, uh, we, we rush into markets, we, we panic out of them. And <clears throat> during the 87 crash, what was discovered <clears throat> by the Brady Commission, uh, that I was called into to, to provide, you know, a lot of this research, that 
they immediately assume that the market crashed because of, of computer trading. And what they found is exactly the opposite, that the computers all were predicting, here comes a crash, but nobody believed it. So most of the fund managers, <clears throat> they simply unplugged their computers. And then what happened when the market reaches a point, what really makes a market crash is something different. It is not uh, some giant short seller that comes in and pushes the market down. Uh, every investigation since 1907 has begun with that theory. Never once have they ever found some giant short position that ever caused the crash. Instead, what happens is the opposite. Everybody that's ever thought of buying has already bought. You now run out of the energy to continue, you know, continue to rise. So it's kind of like raising your hand. Yes, we can all raise a hand, but keep it there. All of a sudden your arm gets very, very tired. You can't hold it up and it becomes so heavy that you have to collapse. When the stock market collapses, what happens is simply that. Everybody that is bought has bought. There isn't another sucker to come in to buy the next high. And why do I say that? Because I was giving a lecture in, in Tokyo in 1987. And what I found out, uh, or I would say 1980, I was giving a lecture in Tokyo after the 1989 crash. And there was this guy that had bribed his way to get in because it was an institutional session. And he came up and he apologized and he said, I just had to talk to you. And I said, what was so urgent? And he said that he had bought the stock market actually the very day of the high at the end of 1989. And what I found interesting was, was that his purchase was $50 million. It was the first time he ever in his life invested in stocks. So now I, I actually met the guy that bought the high. And I asked him, what caused you to do that? And he said, brokers had called him for seven years and said, look, every January, the market goes up 5%. So he watched and watched and watched. And so he finally became convinced. He bought it <clears throat> at the end of December, expecting just to make 5%. Then what happens? The market crashes. He's sitting there with a 30 to 40% loss. He doesn't sell because he's afraid to take the loss. Taking the loss means he has to admit that he was wrong. So it, it's very fascinating that a market will crash largely because you've run out of buying power. Then all the longs turn, they try to sell, there's nobody there to buy. So you get these panic sell-offs. Uh, where a market will just absolutely crash because there's no bid. So we have to understand the human nature behind these things and what is causing it. So what I've seen is that everything is fractal. And in looking at the business cycle, I found that this 8.6 year wave builds up into waves of six of these to form 51.6 years. And then six of those form 309.6 year cycles. Now, you may say, you know, that sounds nice and what is it all about? But effectively, then you have six of those that, that build up into these major cycles that show when the civilizations rise and fall. We're approaching one of these now in 2032. And what will happen is that all the forms of government that we know as today, which they call de democracies, but they're not, they're really republics. Uh, and that will basically change and we'll end up with a new form of government. Uh, same thing <clears throat> at the last time, was the peak in the Roman Empire. 
and all the historians have basically agreed that uh, it peaked with the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And after that, it, it was nothing but downhill. But we can look at, at these things uh, very uh, detailed. But what I discovered was how accurate they were, which was something I never anticipated. Uh, this is the current 51.6 year wave, and it concludes in 2032. But if we look at this wave, why was it so, why are the, is this cycle so uh, incredibly accurate? I discovered something that was, again, I bumped into it in the middle of the night, but uh, 8.6 years <clears throat> happens to be 3,141 days, which is high. And <clears throat> taking these uh, waves back, I uh, have defined them all, all the way back into ancient history from uh, all the way up. So the dates don't change. It's always uh, <clears throat> mathematically back. But this current wave, which began <clears throat> in uh, 1985.65, you had 31 point one years from that, and we came to uh, exactly the day that, that Trump was sworn in. Now, in studying these waves and what happens and how human society changes, uh, there's a lot involved in it, which includes weather, war, um, climate changes, I mean, everything uh, is included. It's much like a, I would say, like a rainforest, that one tiny species is the food supply for something else. And that's in turn for something else again. So um, you take one species out and you create a ripple effect. And this is why the business cycle functions the way it does. It is far more complex. Uh, and governments cannot control it. They cannot manipulate it. Uh, despite uh, all the times that they have tried, even the, for, the uh, former uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, Arthur Burns, who was there when the Fed chairman, Arthur Burns, who was there for the fall of Brent Woods in 1971, said the same thing that the business cycle always wins. So what we have to look at here is there is an incredible level of accuracy. And, and <clears throat> the forecast that we made in 1985, that at that point in time would be the first time that uh, we would see an, a, the potential for an independent president which became Donald Trump. Both Republicans and Democrats hated the guy. But it was also um, Brexit. Uh, we had, the computer had also came out and forecast that Brexit would win. Uh, and Nigel Farage came to our uh, 2019 uh, <clears throat> conference in Rome and he basically said, of course, he had to come because we were the only ones that forecast that Brexit would win. And he called us the alternative to Davos. And the reason he called us the alternative to Davos is Davos is all about manipulating society and controlling it. Um, whereas the research that I've con uh, bumped into, really, uh, is all about how the business cycle functions and government uh, comes and goes. It, you know, the, it predicts the rise and fall of governments. And uh, this <clears throat> has been quite significant. Uh, in, in 1998, I had given a, uh, a conference in London and I didn't realize, but uh, someone from the London Financial Times had, had kind of snuck in the back. And I had stood up and said, okay, fine, Russia's going to collapse, and I give it about 30 days. 
And um, he ended up putting that on the front page of the second section of the London FT. And of course, Russia collapsed. That was the long-term capital management uh, debacle. It was the first time the Federal Reserve had come in and do a bailout. And so then people started saying, oh, well, this model is, is um, influencing too many people. Um, that's when the CIA came in and, and realized that this model could pre predict the rise and fall of countries. Uh, and <clears throat> I offered to run any studies that they wanted, but they arrogantly said no, they had to own it. And I you know, said, sorry, it's not for sale, and I'm not about to go to Washington to go build it in some bunker for them. So what we have to understand here is that the accuracy of, the, of this is quite interesting. Um, the previous wave... Um, there is a, also from the beginning of each of these 8.6 year waves, uh, is uh, another pie target of, you know, you're going in there to 3.14 years. Right to the day, uh, this one in 2010, is when Greece applied uh, for the loan from the IMF, and that started the whole uh, euro crisis uh, markets and the euro had peaked in, in 2008 and that set off a real financial crisis and uh, Greece started dropping and the, the, the traders looked at okay fine who's next and they went after Spain and then France and, and Italy etc. So it was exactly to the day. Going back to the wave before that all right, again, the pie target in that wave uh, came up and it happened to be exactly 9-11. So right again, to that day, something develops. Uh, this is, is quite interesting all the way back because, uh, I mean, just as 9-11 you know, had taken place on this pie target, uh, we find other events exactly the same. I mean, here on the pie target before was the ERM crisis. That's when, you know, George Soros became famous by attacking the British pound and, and the pound was forced out of the ERM and then and, uh, Ireland was forced out of it and the whole thing began to collapse. But this is is quite fascinating. Uh, the 1987 crash, again, it happened right to the day. Um, if we look at uh, everything from going back to even the, uh, the previous wave, which peaked in 1981, that was the high in interest rates. Um, the, the pie target there was the was basically the bottom in, in the bonds, and we, we began to see a, a a strong rally in the bonds at that stage. Uh, at the bottom of that wave was the dollar had been pushed up so high because of the uh, high interest rates that they then needed to devalue the dollar, and that was the Plaza Accord, where the governments band together and said, "Okay, fine, we're going to." Manipulate the dollar lower by 40%. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, called in at that point in time. And <clears throat> it becomes more of a dog and pony show. That they had already pre-concluded that they were going to manipulate the dollar down. So they asked 35 people basically, you know, for opinions or whatever. And nobody suggested that. Uh, they then stand up and, and basically say, oh, we relied upon 35 of the world's experts in foreign exchange and this is what we're going to do. But nobody agreed to that. Uh, I wrote uh, <clears throat> to Reagan at that point in time and I said, you know, you do this, you're going to create a crash in, in two years. Uh, the White House had to respond and I got a two-page letter back 
which was very nice, but uh, that was the 87 crash. These people don't understand even how the economy functions. So what we're looking at is that they had just sold a third of the national debt to the Japanese. Then you're telling them you're going to devalue it by 40% and, and nobody in Washington even does it cross their mind that, gee, maybe they might sell because they're going to lose money. Um, they don't understand how the economy works and politicians stand up and they only do whatever they think is necessary for their own personal career. Uh, there's no long-term thinking on any of this. So uh, we have to understand what, you know, really takes place. And if you go back even to the cycle before that, uh, on the pie uh, target, that's when Ronald Reagan entered the race. Uh, all these things are uh, very important to, to understand. Uh, you go back even to the one coming off of, of 1929. What happens on that pie target, okay? Very simply, that's when Hitler comes to power. All right. Um, and people don't quite understand, but um, what happens here is effectively the um, Keynes himself had put out a report a warning about the uh, and negative effects of the reparation payments on Germany. But people wanted revenge. And what they ended up doing was creating Hitler. Because oppressing the people that much, then, you know, somebody stands up and says, hey, this isn't fair. And that's it. You know, he's in. Okay? And uh, we have to understand that every action does cause a reaction. In ninth, and because of the Great Depression, what happens? 1933, FDR comes to power, Hitler goes to power, and so does Mao. You get political change with the business cycle. You move it to an extreme in either direction and you will get your political change. You get the rise and fall of civilizations will always take place because people basically will vote according to what they see, all right, what they're affected on. So we have to understand that all this is very, very significant. The economic confidence model, um, I've <clears throat> we'll put out a book on it, but I've traced it back through every wave, even into Roman times. All right, and what comes out of this is an incredible regularity that we cannot defeat. And instead of, of constantly creating uh, these crises, which we do create ourselves, all right, we have uh, major, major problems uh, going forward. Uh, why is, is civilization going to change in 2032? Most people don't even realize. They think that they're just voting for uh, Republican versus Democrat, and they're not. There is, some people call it the deep state, but um, that's more of the bureaucracies. There is an element that I call the neocons. What are they? They are people that are there and advise regardless if it's a Democrat or if it's a Republican. Uh, the two presidents that they were against was Kennedy and Trump. Why? Because both were against war. And <clears throat> so you, you can just look at, uh, you can even Google it. Bill Crystal was a very big uh, uh, neocon. I knew Bill. Uh, he even spoke at one of our World Economic Conferences in the late 90s. Uh, and um, I would say over the years he's become more uh, so far right that I call him basically a neocon. And he was vehemently against Trump. Why? Because Trump wouldn't go and invade countries that he wanted to invade. Uh, if you look at what the neocons have done, 
they basically um, did the Iraq uh, nonsense, uh, that there were never weapons of mass destruction. You can Google even the Vietnam War. Um, President Johnson stood up and said, for all he knew, uh, we were shooting at whales that night. The Vietnamese never attacked us. Um, you can just go on and on and on. Uh, no war has ever been started on truth. It's always been lies and propaganda. So the neocons are simply people that um, can't sleep at night because they, they have to hate somebody. And so they have advised, um, regardless of who they are, if it's a Republican or a Democrat, they're there in the White House and they're the ones pulling the strings. Uh, so you hear about bio labs uh, all over the place in, in Ukraine, to, to, on the borders of China. The, this is what these people do. They're not interested in world peace. Uh, they're interested really in world domination. And that's, you know, they don't never stand for election. They just simply get control of, of the, the immediate political apparatus and they push it. So they're at this stage in the game pushing us towards uh, World War III. And this is what part of, of 2032 is about. After this, there'll be a uh, reassessment, uh, they're calling it, they hope for the Great Reset for Bretton Woods 3, but I, they're not going to win. It's not going to be that, that, um, that easy, or uh, I would say we'll never follow the plans that they have. But cyclically, this is where we're headed, and things are becoming much more divided, uh, between now and 2032. The next 10 years is going to be living hell from a lot of things. We see if you come out and you say something that they don't like, you're canceled. Uh, they no longer believe in free speech. So all this is building to a, uh, a monumental change in, in the way systems function. I mean, the last time we had such a major uh, collapse was monarchy was overthrown and that was the beginning of the American Revolution. All right, this time it's going to be republics that are overthrown and we're going to go back to, to a different form of government. Uh, they're hoping more authoritarian. I'm hoping it will be more towards democracy. But this is what uh, we're looking at uh, and the economic confidence model is something that I stumbled upon. It's accurate going back. You can see what happens at each turning point. They're not, you know, fudged. That's it. You can project them out for a thousand years and you can go back a thousand years and see what happened. Uh, I, it is not based upon a predetermined philosophy or uh, <clears throat> any sort of a, a theory. Uh, as I said, you know, you have two ways of doing research. One, you come up with the theory and then you try to prove the theory correct. The other is you look at what's actually happening to understand how it functions. This is what the economic confidence model has come from. Um, and it is something that uh, will live on well after I'm gone. Uh, and if we understand how the cycle works, uh, then we can live with the cycle and reduce the volatility. Uh, but everything is included, from climate change to, um, uh, to basically wars, disease, uh, all these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, climate change has been uh, around for millions of years. Uh, the Iron Age was overthrown by the sea people which, who were basically invading from the north because it got cold up there. So you know, just look at when the, we've had ice ages and things of this nature and people move. And so they all invaded and overthrew just about every Iron Age civilization except the Egyptians. So we have to understand these are 
things that are, are beyond our control. We cannot manipulate the, the, the climate any more than we can manipulate the business cycle. So we, ha we should understand it exists. And as two former chairmen, Arthur Burns and Paul Volcker, both admitted, the business cycle always wins. So I hope this gives an, an idea of what I've spent most of my life trying to understand myself. And I'm hoping to leave this behind so that other people will be able to uh, understand the business cycle and perhaps we can improve society post-2032. So thank you very much and good luck.